We will appeal this court ruling. We will continue the fight in court against this attempt by the right wing and big business to have a do over of our election victory last year. We will also take the fight on the street. The words of council member Shama Sawant talking about a recall effort that is moving into the next phase after a court hearing last week. We're going to talk a little bit more about that case, the council's decision to use city resources to back her up in court. A lot happening with that one. But hey, everybody, welcome back to Seattle News Views and Brews. Feeling great on episode 38. I'm your host, Brian Callanan, and I am also a Seattle Channel host. I should point that out. The fun never stops with this job, I tell you. But the views expressed here on the podcast are my own. Joining me, the man, the myth, the legend, Kevin Schofield from Seattle City Council Insight. Kevin, how are you, sir? I'm good. It's been an exhausting week, but yeah, uh, that's that's but, where the uh, legend comes from. You've been working hard. <laughs> You've been working hard. All right. Our background noise sponsor for the audio podcast, City Grind Espresso from the first floor of City Hall. They are closed, of course, during the pandemic, but we thank them for their support. We also need your support on Patreon, folks really do out there to keep this show rolling. So please contribute and thank you to all of you who do. Some special content always happening for patrons here. We had some on the West Seattle Bridge last week. Hope you listened to that always more coming. Thanks also to Converge Media for the video version of this podcast. Let's get started with right here, right now. All right, so what's happening right now in Seattle politics? A big question as the deadline is up for the Seattle City Council to respond to Mayor Jenny Durkin's veto of their rebalanced budget package. The mayor's main issues there around laying off police officers, as we've discussed before, and changing the SPD's budget. So this veto came up on August 21st. I'm counting about 30 days or so. Here we are, September 21st, this week ahead here. It really is go time. Uh, Kevin, this is going to be a very delicate path to tread for the council and mayor hammering out this agreement ahead. What are you foreseeing there? Uh, you know, at this point, I have no idea. Been, yeah. There's been radio silence on both yeah. sides for two weeks on this since since the council came back from uh, from their from break, their, yeah, uh, their summer recess. Uh -huh. And you know, I would assume they're continuing to talk, you know, behind the scenes. And Council President Gonzalez and Council uh, Member Mosqueda, who's the budget yes. chair, have right. both said that you know there's conversations going on behind the scenes, but yeah. nothing from either side. So it, is it? Is it one of those kind of deals where they they can't really punt because I know they have they have to put together a balanced budget here, but I know that that budget for 2021 is right around the corner. On the 29th, they're going to start up that process. How does that factor into whatever is going to happen here over this next week? Well, it certainly factors in a lot on on, on the staff of both the council yeah. and you know the mayor and the city budget office, right? Yeah. Because you know if they're still negotiating on a 2020 budget then somebody's got to go do all the math on that. Yeah. At the same time, they're doing the math on the 2021 budget. Right. Now, right. It, it is interesting that they've made it a little easier on themselves because normally this year they'd be doing a two-year budget. Right, right, right. It's just a one-year process. 21 and 22. Yeah. Yep. But they, they changed the rules for themselves and said, now this year we're just going to do a one-year budget. Mm -hmm. So that's a little different. Yeah. Um, so yeah. the, and and hopefully a little bit you know the the second year the you know two years out thing it's always been a little iffy yeah. they they yeah. do it but no one really takes it serious because they know the next year is you know they're going to redo a bunch of stuff so it's, yeah. it's an interesting projection of like okay here's what revenues and expenses mm -hmm. you know the things that we start doing now assuming they can carry yes. forward you know there's the, in budget budgeting there's this thing called the bow wave effect right where if you hire somebody mid year this year it's going to cost so much for six months yeah. of, 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 you know, paying them. But then next year, you're going to have to pay them for a full year. So it's yeah. going to be more expensive next year. So sure, understanding sure. kind of what that bow wave effect mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. of hiring and other things, you know, other new programs you start up is really, really important. Yeah. Captain Schofield talking about the bow wave. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I, I, I did. I did want to point out, I actually talked with uh, interim chief Diaz last week on Seattle channel. I hope people can check out the show on, on city inside out. And we covered some good ground. I asked this question with him one-on-one -on -one with him, if he would consider laying off officers uh, or even much less the idea of laying off officers out of order of seniority, like the council was asking him for uh, asking a uh, police chief, former police chief best for his response was he's focused on keeping the department whole. Kevin, it feels like we've gone from a discussion of the council saying we need to cut officers because more than half of our 911 calls do not have crime involved 
to the chief and the mayor's push saying we need to improve response to those 911 calls so we can make sure we're getting to different neighborhoods more quickly. These cuts to the police department should not be happening. How did these sides get so polarized is my question. Well, I mean, I think there's there's a kind of some connective tissue in between those. And that once again, it comes back to this notion of, well, OK, you know, we, we I think everybody agrees. There's broad consensus that we ask SPD to do too much and yeah. that we need to yeah. find Chief other programs to, yeah. do a bunch of, to do a bunch of these things. Mm -hmm. But there isn't actually the plan to do that yet. Mm -hmm. So it, it, to a lot of folks, it seems premature to start cutting SPD now yeah. until we know, you know, who who we're going to ask to do that other work and whether yep. they're staffed up to do it. Right. And so we yep. get, you know, that kind of, you know, full circle back around to 911 response times. Yeah. Right? If we cut police now and, and we actually, and all those calls we want to go to other people are still going to SPD for the moment. Yeah. Their response time is going to get worse. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right? There's, there's... But, you know, I think there's one other budget issue that we make sure with, that, you know, just we get clarity on, yeah, let's you touch know, on. what's going with the mayor and, and, the, and the council and that's the reserve funds. Yeah. Right? where, um, you know, the council wanted to spend a lot of the money mm -hmm. this year. That's in, the, in fact, almost all of it. Yeah. And yeah. the mayor said that's irresponsible because we think that uh, the, the, the revenue deficits this year are going to continue into the next year and maybe even worse. Right. And, and the, the COVID-related expenses yeah. are going to be really high next year as well. Right. I think the council really putting a lot of eggs in the basket of that jumpstart Seattle program for that additional tax on the payroll of the higher earning companies there. I think the council really bullish on that. The mayor, not so much. I, I think she's anticipating potentially a legal challenge there ahead for that. Hey, there's a legal challenge. And it's also a question of, well, how much revenue is that yeah, really, really, really going to bring in? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's that's yeah, a and we see problem. Amazon, you know, expanding in Bellevue, not so much in Seattle mm -hmm. right now. So it's like, yeah. Well, what, yeah. what, what will that really bring up? Yeah, well, we'll see. I, I wanted to point out, too, concurrently to this whole budget discussion here, we've got something coming up next week with the Uber and Lyft minimum wage, a committee meeting coming up this week with Councilmember Mosqueda talking about this effort toward this minimum wage for the transportation network companies, the TNCs out there. She's talking about moving this out of committee. So we're getting real here on a fairly controversial piece of legislation. And, Kevin, we've, we've touched on this before, but I want to talk about this right now. Uber, Lyft, not doing well in terms of revenue, revenue right now. Is it time to put some extra taxes on them? And still a lot of questions over, does this legislation that the council has put out, does it really help all of the drivers out there or just the full-time ones? Your thoughts? Well, it, it, it is definitely skewed towards the full-time drivers. Yeah. The, way, the way it's set up right now is um, it, it, the, the, the council and the mayor want to pay drivers for all the time they're spending in yeah. what they call working. And that yeah. includes what they call P1 time, which is the time that they're sitting in their cars yeah. with their, you know, signed into the app, waiting, waiting to get a call, yeah. mm -hmm. Wait, waiting yeah. to get assigned to, to, uh, to a pickup somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that could be a lot of time. It could be a small amount of time. And a lot yeah. of that depends not only on the demand, but on how many of the drivers are signed into the app, right? Yep. Because they're, they're, you know, sharing sourcing for, for all those. Right. So um, since, uh, since the mayor and the city council want, and this is what happened in New York City, want to uh, pay Uber, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft drivers for that time that there's been waiting for a call, mm -hmm. um, that is a strong disincentive to Uber and Lyft to actually have a bunch of drivers. Yeah, like right? right. So, right. Um, so, you know, what they did in New York City using a similar, but, you know, a couple ways, little sort of nuance, different, but very, mm -hmm. very similar kind of minimum wage standard yeah. is um, Uber and Lyft basically cap the number of drivers who can be signed mm -hmm. in at any given time. Yeah. And that really, um, it, that, that uh, makes, it's a preferential choice uh, for the, um, for the full-time drivers. Yeah. So really disadvantages part-time drivers. Wow. And just the and, whole concept of why we have these app-based services to begin with. I mean, the taxi cabs, I know those are capped at a certain number or whatever else yeah. in our city. And now we're talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, you know, the, the, you know, there's, it's built into Burn Lift's business model mm -hmm. that they're really built around, you know, this is mostly a job for a lot of part-time drivers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And the city and city council in New York city, you know, will say, no, 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 we want, you know, we want this to be really, we want it to be a great full-time job for people who want to do this full-time. Wow. So you want them to be able to have benefits. You want them yeah. to, you know, get paid a, a living wage yeah. and all those things. And, and, 
you know, and it will be, according to the penalty going right now, to the detriment of part-time work, uh, part-time drivers, right, yeah. who are doing this as a second job, you know, as a side gig to try to help make ends meet, right? Right, right. And, and it, you know, it's interesting both for, you know, pu- public policy for for the city to be saying, okay, we are advantaging full-time drivers over part-time drivers, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, you know, basically picking winners there. Yeah. But also telling Uber and Lyft, okay, no, your business model can't be built around part-time drivers. It has to be built around full-time drivers. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a little weird. Yeah, that, that, yeah. That, that they're doing that. So yeah, you know, there's going to be lawsuits around this too. Yeah, yeah. Right? Really changes kind of the whole structure of the gig economy and how we consider it. I think in many ways, if you want to break it apart that way. I wanted to touch on one more piece with this, Kevin. This is going to mean some more work for the Office of Labor Standards for the City of Seattle. I noticed right. in between the last two uh, versions of the legislation creeping up a little bit. At first, it was about $500,000. Now it's looking like over $600,000 to make sure that there are annual appropriations to support four new positions for this. So the OLS, working very hard as it is, is now going to be working even harder. They need four new people to do this. And this sounds like it's really complex, not just rides in Seattle, but originating in Seattle and things of that nature. This is going to be quite a task, I think, for OLS to tackle. Yeah, yeah, and and they've had a lot of work put on their plates, right? Yeah. We've had, you know, hotel worker, you know, uh, legislation that's yep. come out of you know Initiative One Twenty Four mm-hmm. and then gotten rewritten. You know, they've 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 just been asked to take on a lot. In yeah. The last few Sick years. and safe leave. Yeah, you name it. Sick mm-hmm. and safe leave. Yeah. yeah. All the you know, there's some really groundbreaking workers' rights bills that have been passed by this council, mm-hmm. and they really get laid at the feet of LS and and. You know, it's unclear whether anybody's sort of taken a comprehensive look at all this and said, okay, is OLS really staffed up to do all this work? Right, right. You know, they keep, right. they, for some of these bills, they incrementally add some more budget to OLS. For some of them, they don't. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's, that's a big question, right? yeah, especially it, in, a, in a time when we, we're in a budget crunch. I was going to say, difficult time to be talking about ads when we're talking about cuts in so many parts of the budget right now. So, A lot ahead for OLS, a lot ahead for the city council as they discuss that. Let's move on to Now Hear This. Okay, so last week, the city council approved paying with city funds the legal defense for council member Shama Sawant, as they would with any other council member, says council member Andrew Lewis. And this isn't about endorsing anybody's decisions or speculating on the merits of any legal allegations. This is about respecting the process and maintaining an important precedent. And it is a slippery slope if we start picking and choosing who does or doesn't receive these kinds of legal representations. So the council voted seven to one to approve this move. About $75,000 worth of funding is what it looks like it'll be for council member Sawant's defense in this recall effort against her. Council member Juarez, the lone no vote, she had wanted to discuss council members Sawant's use of city property, et cetera, during the protest this summer. One of the points brought up during the recall effort, which we'll get to in a minute. And Kevin, I know this is one of those pro forma type of legal discussions that the council does when something like this happens. It happened back in 2011 with with Richard Conlon when he was supporting the uh, underground tunnel uh, back in the day. But it is difficult to separate the politics, I think, from this when council member Sawant is involved. Your thoughts about that? Well, and, and, you know, she is certainly of the belief that, you know, all decisions are political decisions. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, it, and a little bit, this is sort of coming back to bite her right now. Yeah, right. right. And, and the, you know, the other city council members, all of them are like, said, you know, no, no, this isn't political, right? But this is, this is a, you know, a straightforward thing. Doesn't the, mean we the, agree the, or disagree, etc. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the, the state law, there was a little bit of a confusion about it. And the reason the war is voted no is, is, you know, they got the city attorney's opinion on sort of how to interpret some vague parts of the, of the state law. Right. On this. And Juarez, who is an attorney and uh, former, former judge, judge. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, read it differently. And she said, you know, in, in the council meeting, she said, I have a, I've read it myself. I have a different interpretation of what yep. the city attorney's office is saying. Yeah. And, you know, I, and, and that really comes down to the, the part that she was reading that the city attorney's office said, no, you read this to say that, you know, basically, if she requests it, then the council can approve it. Right. Wow. And, and what Warren said, is, there's another part of the law, which looks to me like it applies, which says that we need to weigh whether, you know, mm-hmm. a reasonable person would believe that these actions that are being challenged in the recall, she did a- as part of, you know, an expectation for things that she would do in office. Yes, yes, right? 
Yeah, that's, it, yeah, I mean, I, sorry, keep going. So the, the split between Juarez and the other seven council members, uh, Swant, of course, was recused from, from voting yes, on this. Yes, right. And wasn't even present for the meeting. Right, right. Um, the split between Juarez and the other seven was really about, okay, how do you read this law? Do we mm -hmm. leave what the city attorney's office says? Mm -hmm. Do we believe, you know, go with Juarez's interpretation? They just yeah. kind of, and the ones who went on the city attorney's like, well, this is just straightforward, basically. Right, right. She requested it. And it doesn't say we have to. Mm -hmm. you know, they had an out. Yeah. They didn't officially have to do it. Yeah. But again, it comes back to there was precedent yep. right, with, yep. with uh, Suwan's predecessor, Richard Conlon. Yes, right. Um, now, it's interesting, you know, the mayor has gone down a different route. She is That's actually, right. She I is paying for her office. own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Check with her, her office. She is actually paying for her own legal defense. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. So that, that's a different difference uh, within these two recall campaigns here. But I want to try to talk about the Sawant court case itself, if we could, Kevin. So Judge Jim Rogers certified these four charges from the recall petition. He says factually and legally sufficient with these to proceed to the signature gathering phase of the recall effort. I want to talk about some of the legal lines that have been drawn here, because, Kevin, you did a great piece on this in SEC Insight. Really seemed like the judge was picking the defense arguments apart here. Yeah, um, and quite honestly, I didn't think even going into to that hearing, they were particularly strong arguments. Mm, okay. There's a lot of arguing technicalities, like, uh, you know, just, 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 uh, you know, all the specific detail have to be in the original petition that the petitioner submitted. Right. Or can, you know, you can expand on that and, you know, legal briefs that come, you know, before the hearing. Yeah. And, uh, you know. So a bunch of technicalities on that, a bunch yeah. of like crazy hand wiping. Oh, look over uh, here. And yeah, like, and the political screed argument or whatever. And else. Yeah, yeah. I, this yeah. is a political screed against, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, against Councilmember Swamp by by her detractors. Yes, right. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, the the uh, you know the attorney for the petitioner, uh, John McKay, a former right. U.S. Uh, U.S. attorney for Western Washington. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, who was um, actually appointed uh, during Jenny George Durkin's Bush. Yeah, predecessor okay. in that role. I, you're right. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he basically just hammered on the facts. Yeah. He didn't even really spend a lot of time on the legal theory and kind yeah. of legal justification. He made, mm -hmm. just really hammered on the facts on, yeah. the, on this. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And, and the judge said, okay. Yeah. And I so, guess. So Juan, so, yeah. So Juan has said that she's going to appeal it. Yes. Which will go like, like with Durkin's appeal straight to the state Supreme Court. Right, right, right. And, and, and a lot still ahead with that, I know. I thought it was very interesting, though. The judge had that piece to say about the Seattle Ethics and Elections Committee, about something related to the first charge in the recall here, that she's left decision-making up to her political party, socialist alternative there. All so right. uh, this whole charge actually stemmed from a, 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 a basically three-month investigative reporting effort that I put in that yes. ended up in a story in January in 2019 talking mm -hmm. about how you know, um, I uncovered some uh, social alternative internal documents and memos that showed that council member Swan had basically delegated a major portion of her decision making as a, as a city council member to socialist alternative to decide yeah. to make decisions on legislation on, mm -hmm. on her behalf. And in particular, the, the charge from that that uh, got looked at by uh, um, one of Sawant's um, uh, competitors uh, in the in the uh, election last year, okay. uh, Logan Bowers was one of two people who filed a complaint with the Ethics and Elections Commission right. on you know based on the the, the um, reporting that I had done. Yep. And specifically, one of the, the charges was around this notion that um, one of her employees in in the office um, had uh, Socialist Alternatives Executive Committee had decided to fire him. Mm, right. right. And so this is an outside organization making hiring and firing decisions for right. people on the city uh, payroll. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Which is, you know, it's about three different violations of the law, right. including right. a violation of uh, Councilmember Suwan's oath of office. Yeah. Like yeah. So um, the Ethics and Elections Commission looked at that, said, well, it looks discretionary to us. Mm. And, you know, we talked to Suwan and she, what she said was, you know, she never had a disagreement with the SEC mm -hmm. and, you know, she had a strong, you know, hand in, you know, basically she could always convince the SEC of, you know, what she thought was right. Mm, okay. And so that the, the, um, the elections commission basically said, yeah, and, you know, it's an election year and we'd rather just have the voters decide this than, yeah, than, than try right. to decide, you know, to, to weigh in an election year. Okay. Which okay. Is, was really pretty weak need on their point. 
So yeah. they, they, they kind of weaseled out of, of a, you know, a, a hard job of, of weighing in, which is really their job to do. And, and that's basically what the, what the uh, judge said this week in his ruling. He looked yeah. at that and said, now, wait a minute. Were you, you know, were you quoted her as saying that, you know, she could always manage to convince the executive mm -hmm. committee of, of, well, that basically is her admitting yeah, that but she was the doing executive that. committee was making the decisions, yeah, right? Yeah. So, you know, she basically admitted guilt mm -hmm. in doing that, right? Wow. And, and so, you know, there's plenty of evidence here, including documents that they were making these decisions, that they made the decision to, to, uh, to fire this employee. And, and, you know, and the judge at the end of the day doesn't have to decide whether it's true or not. True. Right. He just has to say like, you know, if the evidence that exists is in fact true, right. And the voters get to weigh that decision. Yes. Is it, is it factually and legally sufficient? And he said, yeah, it's absolutely factually and legally sufficient. For that. Yeah. So he really, you know, ripped apart the decision of the ethics and elections commission and said that just like, he said, it is not persuasive to say the least. Yeah. It was his, I mean, his quote for his take on it. Wow. All right. Well, a lot still ahead on that one. Thank you for that, Kevin. I wanted to move on to another huge story from the end of last week. The Office of Professional Accountability now starting to put out reports about their reviews of police officer conduct during the early days of protests after George Floyd's death. Let's talk about these two high profile cases, Kevin, that are going to get a lot of scrutiny. One where an officer had a knee on a protester's neck, if we can tackle that first, and then the other where a young child was pepper sprayed by an officer. So the knee on the neck case, I know you went into detail on this with the OPA director, Andrew Meyerberg. That's right. And, you know, and, and, and uh, I got a chance to look at the, um, the um, reports from the OPA on this that, that they published last Friday. Yeah. Uh, so everybody can look at it now. Yeah. And, um, you know, basically, you know, and in some ways, you know, it looks bad from the beginning because it's just a few days after the murder of George Floyd. Yes. Where an officer put Had his a knee, knee on the neck, yeah. On the neck for eight and a half minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was clear that he was restricting the breathing of George Floyd. Yeah. And there was nothing else going on. You know, it, it, things were calm around them. Right, he just right, right. Sat right. There for eight and a half minutes like that. Yeah. And this um, was you know, different. What, yeah, definitely a lot more what, what, chaos and et what yeah. OPA director Meyerberg said was this is, you know, different on a number of different levels. Mm -hmm. It was a chaotic situation right there. Mm -hmm. You know, he, the officer, a number of of their officers, it was right outside the T-Mobile store. They were, you know, arresting people as they were, you know, as looters were coming out of mm -hmm. the store, yeah. they were arresting them, putting them on the ground in what they call prone handcuffing position on yes. their stomach. So right. they could, you know, and then holding them down um, so they could handcuff them and right. then, you know, immediately moving on to the next person once that yes. person was secured. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the, this incident lasted not eight and a half minutes, but 13 seconds. Yeah, 13 seconds, Beginning right. And 13 seconds. Um, the, and, and what SPD officers are trained to do in those situations where they're prone handcuffing somebody is put their knee kind of right in between the top of the shoulder blades. Right? Yeah, right behind you know, or right, right below, below the neck. Yeah. the base of the neck, mm -hmm. right? And... Um, it, it is clear from the video, according to Director Meyerberg, mm -hmm. that the officer did in fact put his knee on the neck. But when they talked to the uh, when they talked to the uh, officer who was doing yeah. it, mm -hmm. he thought he'd put his knee at, at the sort of base of the neck, top the of the proper shoulders. spot. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, the officer who was actually sort of handcuffing the, the, the suspect, you know, heard protesters nearby shouting, take your knee off his neck, take your knee right, off his neck. Right, he looked right. over and moved the officer's knee kind of yep. farther down. Yeah. Um, so he clearly saw that, it, you know, it, it, it looked wrong from there. But, right, right. Um, so what they said was, look, it was a clear violation. The knee was on the neck, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they, they sustained that. But it was not at all clear that the officer was trying to restrict his breathing by right. putting the knee on the neck. So in right. terms of that part of the complaint, yeah. they found it unfounded. Got it. Now this officer also made a whole bunch of incredibly unprofessional comments that were caught on body worn video. Yes. Um, sort of before and after that particular mm -hmm. incident. Mm -hmm. And those are all sustained as well. So yeah. he's facing a bunch, he's facing discipline now for a bunch of unprofessional conduct yep. and for violating the training by putting the knee on the neck. 
Yeah. And, uh, well, a host of issues there, including working at the end of a really long shift, which I know is a big, a big part of the question here for Seattle police and how they use force and how their officers use, uh, have unprofessional or professional conduct. But I wanted to talk about this other piece here, Kevin, with regard to a young boy who was pepper sprayed, 13,000 complaints coming in about this one case. So many people saw this viral video of a young boy crying, getting milk poured on his eyes, et cetera, after yeah. this pepper spray incident happened. I know that Andrew Meyerberg went back and forth on this, and they put together a long discussion about what happened here, but they have yeah. not found that officers acted inappropriately here, and, and that's difficult for a lot of people to hear. Yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to break down here, and, and it is really, really difficult, and, and Director Meyerberg you know, told me that he, he felt very conflicted and uh about this particular incident yeah. um so first of all you know let's talk about the the video that went viral yeah. on this right on social media that you know generated thirteen thousand complaints yes the video does not show the pepper spray yeah it shows so several after, seconds after the before, pepper yes. spraying the boy um uh, you know uh, an aid person pouring milk on his face and him crying and mm -hmm. and, and screaming right yep um so opa tr investigators uh, tried to contact uh, the, the the father and and son to, mm -hmm. to interview them. Yes, uh, they referred OPA to their attorney. Yes, right. They contacted the attorney. The attorney never got back to them. So yeah. they never actually had an opportunity to interview the father and son. About got this. it. Um, what uh, what they did get, and you know, let's remember of the thirteen thousand complaints, almost none of them were people who actually witnessed the right. event. There were people who saw yep. the video online, didn't thought like it was it. horrible, yep. didn't yep. like it, and emailed OPA. Yep. Right? So what OPA did was they went and they collected um, uh, body cam video from a yes. bunch of officers who yes. were there right. and sort of pieced together from different angles what happened. Yep. In fact, they released a five-minute video, which is a compilation of those different ones. Yes. Now, right. there's a couple pieces. At, at what happened at first when that video went out was um, some people on social media identified a particular officer. That yes. They, was. It turns out it was not that officer. That mm -hmm. officer was standing about 15 feet off to the right of where it was. Yeah. And one of the videos that they show um, uh, in this compilation yeah. is a body-worn video from that officer. Right. He right. clearly he's, he's, not using pepper spray at him. all in this incident. Right. Yeah. So what? It, it, when you look at all these videos, and I encourage everybody to go look at all the yeah. video, watch no. it 10 times. Yes. I got to watch it you know, with, with uh, Director Meyerberg. Yeah. And, and then him sort of narrating what he and his team kind sure. of went through and pieced together with all yes. of this. Um, you see um, what started was uh, uh, a protester being arrested yeah. in the 15 feet over to the right area, yeah. right? And they, the officers had sort of been planning that for a little bit because that protester had, apparent, had allegedly tried to steal someone's, uh, an officer's pepper spray can earlier in the day. Yes, right. right. So they sort of approached slowly and then suddenly made a move to go grab him and arrest him, mm -hmm. right? That caused a stir in the crowd. The rest of the officers on the line all said, move back, move back, sure. move back, yep. Yep. right? Over the course of, you know, 10, 15 seconds, something like that. Mm -hmm. You see in the videos, one woman wearing a white shirt mm -hmm. kind of move from the left side into the middle, kind yes. of right into the front. Right. And she um, starts sort of shouting and pushing at an yes. officer there, grabs, his, grabs baton his baton, right, and starts a tug of war with him over this. Right? Yes. And in the meantime, while that's going on, the father and son had moved right behind right her. behind that woman. Yes. And in fact, you know, you could see the father, but you actually couldn't see the son. You know, he was really obscure. And, yes. and, and that's important because the officers could not see him. Yeah. So then what happened yeah. was while this tug of war is going on, a supervisor comes running out behind the officer who's in this tug of war yep. with the woman. Mm -hmm. And over his shoulder, the supervisor is the one who does the pepper spray. And he yeah. pepper sprays the woman. Right. When he pepper sprays her, after a moment, she ducks and yes. turns. Right. And it, some of it deflects, some of the pepper spray deflects off of him, clearly off, onto the off father, of her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. probably onto the top. Yeah, yeah. Right. And that's how it happened. And yeah. so, um, and there's like five different angles in this yes. video compilation that you can see all, all of this from. And, and so what OPA concluded from this was that it was an appropriate use of pepper spray because mm -hmm. this woman protester was um, in fact engaged, you know, in, in a struggle with a police officer. Right. Right. 
and there, you know, there were not a lot of good alternatives for how to subdue her. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, um, they said, uh, the officer clearly did not target the boy. In fact, couldn't right. even see that the boy was there. Right. 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 And so, um, they did not sustain the complaint against the officer for pepper spraying the boy. Right, right. Right. And I know that was something that director Meyerberg had, had a lot of angst about, but I think it really does raise that larger question of when should pepper spray be used? I know black That's lives right. matter has said, let's just use it in these specific indications when it's a one-on-one -on -one type deal. Right. It, it, that would basically take it out of any crowd control situation altogether, with that, which I think some people would say, great. But uh, fact, I think that's, that's, that's the big that, question here. That's exactly what Black, Black Lives Matter, Seattle City, King County, asked Judge Richard Jones to do with yeah. the injunction back earlier mm -hmm. in the summer. Right. Is to say, um, you know, the pepper spray should only be used in situations when there is no risk of splash onto other people. Yeah. Like exactly what happened in this situation. Crowds yeah. where people are just close by, splash yeah. is inevitable. Yeah. And and Judge Jones said, no, I'm not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. And and one of the big issues around this is it, it's is that this is the larger context of, you know, uh, uh, less, lethal we less lethal weapons are mm -hmm. mandated for the police to have and be trained on yeah. so that they have an alternative to going to you know, batons or and guns or whatever else. Yeah. Guns right. And lethal, and lethal force. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if we one by one take away all of these other alternatives, mm -hmm. they have nothing left. Yeah. Right. So it, it, you know, it's not a great option for them to yeah. use this. In yeah. fact, it's probably a bad option. Right. But it may be a better option than them not having it. Right. And I'm not saying, yeah. I'm not saying I necessarily agree. No, nope, I understand what you're saying. This is a super, super, complicated mm -hmm. issue where people can have valid you know viewpoints all over the spectrum on this yeah right? yeah um but but there is absolutely that issue too that, yeah like that this that this case raises the yeah. of hey you know should they be using pepper spray yeah in in you know crowd control cases and it mm -hmm. raises a larger issue with that that both the opa and the office of inspector general have raised yep. around crowd control tactics and yeah. the fact that there is no law enforcement agency in the country that has figured out if you have a small number of bad actors in a large piece yes, of crowd, right. how do you extract them without yeah. disrupting the crowd? No. Right? Nobody's figured that out. Right? No. And OPA Director Meyerberg in his report uh, to the council and to Judge Robart, yeah. you know, called for innovation. He said, look, we got to go figure that out. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's, but that's nobody's figured way. it out yet. No, they haven't. And I know we're going to see more reports, more reports from the OPA over the next several weeks here. And we're yeah, going to talk more about those as they come out. Yeah, yeah, they're expecting to put out five to 10 every two weeks. Got it. Got it. We'll keep tabs on what's going on there. Let's move on to what's next. All right, Pier 58, whole lot of shaking going on there last week. A collapse, two workers injured as the city tried to take this piece of the waterfront park apart here. Some really scary pictures to watch there, Kevin. Very fortunate no one else was hurt. Very fortunate the aquarium right there didn't get damaged, etc. But in looking at this, Kevin, the city had a series of reports about just how dangerous this pier was over the last several years. They cranked up the demolition schedule a few weeks ago, as we know. But this idea to defer any maintenance on this pier over the last several years because it was going to be torn down anyway, that's the decision that I think is a real challenge here. Yeah, and, and there's a couple levels to that, right? Yeah. So, so in the um, late 70s and 80s, there were some pier collapses, in yeah. wooden pier collapses along the waterfront in mm -hmm. Seattle. And so in 1990, uh, the Department of Construction Inspections pa uh, passed a director's rule, which basically put in place a waterfront pier management uh, maintenance regime, including yeah. that wooden, you know, all the wooden components of a pier needed to be inspected every five right. years. Right, right, right. And, you know, one of the issues with Pier 58, it, 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 well, you know, they've been doing those in inspections on the wooden components every five years. Right. And, uh, you know, and they were deteriorating. They were very yeah. clearly deteriorating. And yes. They, you know, projected out how bad it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And it looked like it was going to, you know, be at an end of its life right around right. the time that they were planning on basically, you know, demolishing the entire thing and replacing it as part okay. of the whole waterfront renewal process. Anyway, yes, right, right, right. Basically two years from now. Right? Yeah. 
the goal is let's get it through two years, you know, mm-hmm. to 2022. We're going to sure. tear it down and we're going to replace it. They've got funding in place for that. Yeah. You know, it was, it, that, that was basically all, all set to do. Yeah. Now, the problem here was the components that failed on Pier 58 that caused this collapse. Um, and in fact, caused it, them to close it a few weeks ago mm-hmm. when they saw it starting to move away from, from the seawall. Yeah. Were not the wooden components. There's yeah. a whole section you can probably remember of uh, on the north terrace of, of Waterfront Park. Mm-hmm. It's concrete. It's yep. got the Fitzgerald fountain on it. It's yep. gorgeous. Yep. And that's all, it's concrete um, pier. And below that is supported by steel beams and yes. what they call monotubes, which are yeah, yeah. steel uh, tubes filled with concrete. Right, right. right. Those failed. What happened yeah. was the caps right at the top of those of those of those pilings, right where it meets the concrete pier, you know, above mm-hmm. it, failed, and basically the pier just started sliding to the yeah. left, yeah, and it was pulling the rest of the pier with it. Yep. that's what pulled it away from the seawall. Yeah, and and so when they went in to demolish it, they had to go basically start with that. Yeah, they were just basically finishing up getting all the decorative components so they could start pulling out some of the other right you know pieces of the fountain and all that when um a section a concrete section basically just collapsed straight down yes and it pulled the rest of the concrete part with it so all the concrete yeah. part is all underwater now yeah right but, Which is but a it does huge it, headache. You know, yes certainly from a policy issue it says hey look somebody needs to go back and look at this you know absolutely this a- ancient you know, peer maintenance policy and say, mm-hmm. hey, you know, why does it just say the wood components, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and you got to look at all the know, components, right? 10 years ago, 10 years ago, they did do a, a, um, an inspection of all the components of Pier 58. But yeah. five years ago, they just looked at the wooden ones. They yeah. didn't look at these other ones. And That's right. Done a hard look. You know, it may be that five years ago, the, you know, they certainly knew 10 years ago that there was corrosion. Yes. In the, in the concrete part of it as well. Right, right. Right, but um, five years ago, they don't have any data on how, yeah. on how that was. Wow. Um, so you know, it, the, it seems like it's a really good case for saying that that policy needs to change. Yeah, that needs to be updated. Yeah. So they're really looking at every single component of those of those right. waterfront piers. Right, and we're going to keep an eye on that over the next couple of weeks too. But we're running short on time here, Kevin. So I wanted to make sure as we wrap up the Coffee Break podcast here with something sweet every now and then, uh, a treat here. <laughs> This is actually, you probably heard the fork, fork move in there. This is actually a cake from my birthday that my daughter just made for me. Happy birthday to me. So hey, this happy is, birthday. thank you, thank you. It's, oh, a chocolate, so it's a chocolate good. cake, but this is the chocolate beet cake. Mouth watering as I get close to it. So my mom made this for me when I was a kid. I was like, oh, awesome. These are chocolate chips. And she said, yeah, yeah, that's right, kid. Keep on eating that. Full of beets, <laughs> these little chips in here, all beets. I got to say, it makes for something so sweet when you eat it there. I really do still think it's chocolate, and it's one of the moistest, most awesome cakes of all time. So You can't beat uh, it, huh? Yeah. Ah, I see what you did there. Uh, I see what you did there. (laughs) Just punishing you on your birthday. No, no, no. Thanks. I better have a bite of this while I still can. Mm, That is good, good stuff. Um, Kevin, I always uh, love your insights on all things baking and all things civically inclined. I really do appreciate you being here. Thanks a lot. And thanks to you, Brian. Okay. Hey, guess what, everybody? Next time you want to know what's happening in local politics, give us a listen here on Seattle News Views and Brews. Find out what's brewing. You can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Please support us on Patreon if you like what you're hearing. And thank you so much for listening. Thanks also for watching on Converge Media. We'll see you next time. Seattle News Views and Brews is an independent production of Callanan Media Services. Copyright 2020.